I believe, I'm just so dumb, I believe that if Moses was walking up on a mountain and a bush lit up on fire and, and the bush started speaking to him, God speak, speaking through that bush, an audible noise and told Moses some stuff. You know, I'm just stupid enough, I believe that. How many of y'all believe that? Huh? I believe it. So as we say that, Buckle your seat belts because God's gonna, got some interesting things to say to us this morning uh, from the book of uh, Romans. And go ahead and put that next slide up. It would be fine. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and righteousness. Because, that what, uh, that, because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has showed it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because when, uh, although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the, uh, changed the glory of, uh, of the incorruptible God into a... Um, image like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And the next word is the only word I want you to, to talk about this morning is therefore. Okay, We'll stop right there. Next week we'll pick up with uh, the second word, therefore God. I want to go through this little section here and point out a few things to you. Uh, make, some, make some points. And um, hopefully... Uh, We'll learn a little bit more about the book of Romans. Go ahead to the next slide, please. The first uh, couple of verses here. For the wrath, of, uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because, that what, uh, may be, because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Let's look at that. Let's break that down a little bit. For the wrath... Of God. Now, when I say wrath to you as Eastern, excuse me, as Western culture, we have a we have a, a picture, don't we, in our mind? If I say that guy was wrathful, we we envision um, this display, if you will, of anger uh, that is a, a lot of times irrational. You know, uh, the guy that gets the gun and goes to the post office, he shoots everybody. He's just filled with wrath. Just a few weeks ago, um, uh, Gabby Gifford, their name, this guy was just, this wrath. He just goes out and shoots people for no apparent reason. So when you read that scripture for the wrath of God, in American culture, we want to dismiss that word wrath. Because we don't understand how a loving God can have wrath. How is that possible? Well, we see it because the word there is, is, is orge, or orge, which means anger based upon the character of the individual. How can God be filled with wrath? If he's a loving God, I think that's the answer, isn't it? Because he's a loving God. He, because he loves, he cannot tolerate things that go against his character. If God were a liar, then lying would be right. Do you see what I'm saying? If God were a liar, then lying would be right. But because God is not a liar, because God is a truth teller, lying is wrong. Look at these next couple of words here. We'll, we'll get in this a little deeper. The, the, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against ungodliness, a sebia, which, which means a want of reverence toward God, and unrighteousness, which is a adikia, which means a violation of divine law. So he says his wrath is against, first of all, unrighteous, or excuse me, ungodliness, which is the failure to reverence God. We put the two words together sometimes in our culture. We say unrighteousness and ungodliness are the same thing. 
But in the Eastern culture, in the Hebrew culture, in the, in the, in the original Greek and, and how they understood things, ungodliness was different than unrighteousness. Ungodliness was the failure to reverence God, to put God where He belonged, which is on a throne. So when men began to take God down from where he rightfully belonged and bring him down to their level, that was ungodliness. But then unrighteousness is an outward act of, of disobedience toward the known will of God. For example, lying. That is unrighteousness. Now because of God's character, he has wrath toward people who don't follow those rules. I don't like that. Well, I don't either, but it's there. You see, I, if I had, if I could be God or make God, God would be a little more flexible. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> He'd just be a little more flexible. Um, I didn't use God's name in vain much. I was only slightly drunk. I just looked at the swimsuit issue. I didn't look at Playboy. I'm only a little dishonest. And if I were God, I'd pat you on the back. I'd say, great, you're getting there. But God ain't like that. God says unrighteousness is a violation of divine law. I want you to understand that law wasn't given. God didn't sit down one day and, and have a, a, maybe a council meeting and have all of his council, his leadership council get together and say, okay, you know, you know what, those people down there are having way too much fun. Have you seen them lately? They're having a blast. We need to make up some rules so they don't have any fun. That's not how the law came about. The law is not given so that you don't have fun. That's not what it's for. First of all, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law points to Jesus Christ, first of all. But in a practical manner, the law was given so that man would know the character of God. That's what, the, that's what the law was given for, so they would know who God was and how He was. And so what is Paul saying? Paul is saying that God's wrath, which is anger based upon what His character, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And you say, well, how is that possible? How does God reveal His wrath? Well, Verse 19, because what may be known of God. I want to know God. I want to know about God. I want to know everything there is to know. May be known of God. Look at this. This is a real interesting words. Is manifest in them, inside of them, for God has shown it to them. Did you find that interesting? Well, so, well what do you mean? Well, you can't go anywhere in the world that, that man doesn't have an innate desire to worship something you can't go anywhere in the world you can't go to the pygmies in Amazon you get there guess what they're going to have something that they worship why is that because God said it is manifest in them it is inside of them to worship I put it in them your atheist friend, your agnostic quote unquote friend, he might be as he might be so atheistic you can't believe how atheistic he is, but God put in him a desire to worship. Well, he doesn't have one. Yeah, it's there because he said it's in there. And then the second thing, because God has shown it to them. How does he do that? Go to the next verse. Next slide. Thank you. For since the creation of the world, His attributes, that God is love, God is omniscient, God is omnipresent, His attributes are clearly seen, 
being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I want you to go back to your atheistic friend. I want you to go back to your pygmy friend, if you have a pygmy friend. If you don't have a pygmy friend, perhaps you could, never mind. They are without excuse. Why? Your atheist friend may be very well intentioned, but he has no excuse when it comes to God. Why? Because since the creation of the world, God's attributes are clearly seen by the things he made. Really? Really? Yeah. Back in the olden days, real long time ago, uh, this is my uh, Don Hood version of events. God said, you know what, it's dark down there, let's make light. And he made light, and he separated from the light from the darkness. And the light, the division of the light and the day, he called morning and evening. And he said, then that was the first day. And then there was a second day, and a third day, and a fourth day, and a fifth day, and a sixth day. And all of that was done so that God... And his attributes could be clearly seen. And while I'm here, I'm going to park here for a minute, put my car in park, get out, chase a rabbit. For those of you that are here, and, and you may be, because it's a, it's a, I guess since I got out of high school, it's becoming a bigger and bigger thing, uh, that believe that that first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day were, were ages, were eons, were you know millions of years between day one and day two, and... And, and all that kind of stuff. And some people are, some people are taught that. There's a, there's a Greek word or a Hebrew word for that. Okay. No, 24-hour days, dude. Well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Okay, well, then get, make up your mind to believe the Bible. Because the Bible says the morning and the evening were the first day, the second day. You know, the sun didn't come up for 46 million years, and they go down for 46 million years, and they come up. It can't, it's 24-hour days. That's the first reason. We say, well, I just don't, still don't know if I believe that. Okay, let's just say you believe the whole eons and ages and all that kind of stuff. We've got a real problem going on here when you get down to about day three. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is if you, if you read uh, verse three in Genesis, God made the light. What is the light? How many of y'all think, uh, what, what do you think the light is? Wrong. <laughs> it's not. How do you know that? The sun was on the fourth day oh well wh wait a minute well what was the light I don't know it wasn't there okay don't know but now here, here's your problem on the third day God called the land up out of the water and what else happened what, 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 was, what was on the land what, what quote grew on the land plants now all y'all that have been had bio I'm not trying to treat y'all like you're silly but it's just funny how this all works out what do plants have to have to survive? What? No, what do they have to have? Specific. They had water already, but what do they have to have now? Sunlight. Okay, if we're going to believe that there's millions and billions of years, how do those plants grow? Between this third million years and the fourth million years, how'd they grow? Dang. Well, there wasn't no sunlight. Not until what? The boy, wasn't God smart? Isn't that really? I mean, because everything is just sequential. So if you believe in ages, you got a real problem between day three and day four. A real problem. Plants can't grow without the sun. They could survive the night, can't they? But they can't survive a million years. They can survive a night. Probably couldn't survive a week without the sun, do you think? There ain't no thousand years there. I said all that to say this. I'll get back in my car, take it out of park, because I parked there to chase that rabbit. Because of those little things, his attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that were made. What was made? Name some things. What were made? Huh? Animals. Huh? 
Adam and Eve, people, dirt, water, uh, stars, everything was made. Everything was made. And everything that was made cries out, there is a God. Isn't that interesting? Go to the next uh, slide. Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world, all who live in it, for He founded it upon the seas and established it on the waters. Now, how much of the earth does God own? Why? Because He made it. So everything. Look at this Isaiah 40, 22, one of my favorite verses. He sits enthroned upon the circle of the earth, which is interesting in and of itself. The circle of the earth? Where did all this flat earth thing come from? God said it was, in a, cir it was a circle long before, uh, who was it, Christopher Columbus, I guess. And his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Psalm 24, verse 1. And that's the, wrong, that's the wrong psalm. That should be Psalm 19. Is that right? I can't remember now. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. You go out at night. Uh, some of you will have the privilege of maybe going to Honduras or you've been to somewhere else. And you get out in the country there and there is no light pollution. None, zero. No, there's no headlights, street lights or anything. And you look in the sky. You'll see stars that you've never seen before. You'll see things you have just, it will blow your mind. You'll see, you'll see things that you can barely see in this, on this uh, uh, hemisphere that you'll see down there that you will know, blow your mind. And God said every bit of that shows to man that there is a God. For by Him, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible, and look at here, invisible, wow. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, that's, that's good and evil, that's, that's everything good, everything bad. It was created through Him and, what's that what next word? For Him. For Him. Well, you mean to tell me He created everything for Himself? Yeah, guess who's included in that? <laughs> I don't like that. It's okay. My point being here that men, God says, man has no excuse. Your friends or my friends, the people that are on, was it Discovery Channel, History Channel, National Geographic Channel that make up all these documentaries about how the earth was really made and, and, and how there's no God because they figured it all out and they've got all this paperwork and reams of computer papers and they've just proven it. You know what they are? We're going to find out here in just a minute. Go to the next slide. Because although they knew God, how did they know Him? How did we just discuss? How did they know Him? Because he spoke to them. He was in, remember, he was in them, and he showed himself to them. But when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. They weren't thankful, and they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That word fools there. I'm break your heart here. Now, you, you'll find this kind of humorous, actually. That word fools there. What does it mean? Where, what's the Greek word there? The Greek word is moros. M-O-R-O. -O. Anyone want to guess what the word that we get from that word is? <laughs> Moron. Let's just be honest here. Because professing themselves to be very brilliant and smart, they became morons. <laughs> That's what the word says, okay? You know? And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like a corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. When they knew God, 
they didn't glorify him as God. But they decided to change him into what? Wow. Uh, they changed him into an image like man. They worshipped man. They began to worship themselves. How does that happen? Well, it's pretty simple, really. We're arrogant, aren't we? We're arrogant. So now we believe that we got all the answers. So I don't need God anymore. And after all, this God guy, I've never seen him. <laughs> but they go back to what I said before. He revealed himself to them. Birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Guys, that's worshiping cattle in uh, India. That's worshiping birds in certain parts of the world. And that, that's, that's worshiping, we find out later, the creation more than the creator. That's when we begin to look at the creation as more important than the creator. Probably one of the big things back in their day that they knew about was the Nile River overflowed its banks every year and it brought a fertile ground so that they could grow crops. And rather than saying, wow, God's been good to us. Look, he, he let us live by this river and this river overflows. And now we can grow crops. What did they do? They began to worship what? They began to worship the river. They began to say the river was an entity. The river was a God. The river did this for us. They began to say the sun is our God. Because it gives us warmth. They began to say, well, the the weather God is, is, is angry with us, so we got snow. They changed God. They exchanged the glory of God for the shame of man. They exchanged the incorruptible God for a corruptible idol. And they changed the truth of God for the lie of man. I'm not going to turn there. I'm just going to quote it for you. But Hebrews chapter 6. Why is this important? Wow, I, I don't know. Because, I, because we're going through the book of Romans and it was the next section. And you would be partially right. But partially you'd be wrong. Why is it important to understand who God is? Or, or, or just to understand that there is a God. Which, is, which essentially is what, what Paul's saying. It's just important that you know that there is a God. He does exist. Because Hebrews says in chapter 11 verse 6. Without faith it is impossible to please him. Who? God. For he that cometh to God, you ready? Must believe that He is. Do you understand that your friend, my friend, the, the people in the world, whatever, they cannot come to know Jesus Christ until they first understand that there is a God. He does exist. You can't go around that. I believe in Jesus. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and yada, yada, yada. But I tell you what, I don't believe that God thing. Now, how silly does that sound? It's so important that Paul took, and you're going to find out several verses to talk about the importance of knowing that there is a God and you and I are accountable to Him. That's what I'd like to challenge you to do. I'd like to challenge you to first of all do, do two things this morning. And some of this will be really easy for you. The first one will be easy for most of you. I'd like to challenge you to challenge your friends that there's a God. He does exist. He's out there. He's real. Here's the, th here's the second thing. It might be a little harder even for some of you because we are so arrogant. I'd like you to challenge yourself that God may not be who you think he is or what you think he is. What are you saying? 
I'm just saying, all of us got a tendency to put God in a box. Got him all figured out. Maybe we don't. Good book for you to read. Excellent book. The Jesus I Never Knew by Philip Yancey. If you've not read it, it's a great book. And that's if you're not reading your Bible. I really thought, you read your Bible first, that'd probably be the best thing. And as we go through these next few weeks, we're going to talk a lot about sin. S-I-N. How many of y'all hear that word very much anymore? I don't hear it very much anymore. It's sad, but we don't. Uh, I mean, you know, you hear it some, but sin. We're going to talk about sin, the way that sin separates us from God. Sin prevents us from knowing God and prevents us from serving God and it prevents us from worshiping God for who He is. Our sin causes us to change the glory of the incorruptible into a corruptible. Well, how do we do that? I'll give you just one example. So many of us, and I'm not saying this is sinful, just go with me on this. So many of us, if we were if we took away and could get to your heart, my heart, pull us out, are we dependent on God? I mean, truly dependent upon God? What if you lost your job and your house and everything you had tomorrow? In 1930, the Great Depression, the crash, 29, whatever the crash was, 29. You know, a lot of people had it happen to them. And I'm not saying it's going to happen more, I don't know. And you know what they did? What did they do? Jumped out of windows. Because whether no matter what they said, the reality was that wasn't, you know, no matter that if they said, well, I trust God, the reality, when the reality was moved away from them, they realized that they didn't trust God, they trusted in their riches. How many of y'all, when you were singing a little while ago, that it crossed your mind when, when uh, Darlene Sheck said, uh, all the words I can't remember, but, uh, we would lay down our lives. We would give everything we have. How many of that crossed your mind saying, well, I don't know if I'd really be there or not. You know, I, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, I just tell you, I was back to back. I was thinking that. Would I do it? I don't know. And if it's okay with God, if it's okay with you know, Him, it's okay with me, then I don't have to find out tomorrow, okay? That's great. That's great. But what are we really dependent upon? It's our sin that separates us between us and our God. Us, our will from His will. It's sin. But I'm so thankful that a little bit later on, in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul in verse 20 says, But you know what? Where sin grew, where sin became strong, where sin abounded, where sin took over, where, where sin became so large, Paul said grace became larger. Grace was bigger. Grace was greater. So I got this terrible sin, now that you mention it, between me and God. I don't know what to do. Take it to Jesus. His grace is greater than that sin. His grace is greater than the result of the poor decision you may have made in life. 